Hello everyone and welcome again to the Expert Eye Radiology channel. This is Dr. Tamer Gawish. This is the second video about MRI of the knee and this is a brief presentation of the common pitfalls, classification of meniscal tears and hidden lesions uh, commonly seen at MRI of the knee. So first let's review some of the common MRI pitfalls. These are normal variants and should not be mistaken for pathological changes. Number one is the striated meniscus and this is a normal striation. This is a normal striated hyperintense signal. Uh, we see this at the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. This is very common at the young age and you can notice that the epiphysis is not still um, uh, fused at this uh, study and this is the normal meniscal striation. These are the normal radial fibers of the meniscus. Second most common is the meniscal vascular signal and we talked about this at the previous presentation. Uh, so before 25 of years uh, Slight hyperintensity within the meniscus, commonly at the base, is uh, always re um, representing the meniscal vascular signal. That is the uh, vascular supply of the meniscus, uh, and this is accepted up to 25 years of age. And after that, you cannot accept this. Uh, so till 25 years of age, with no history of trauma and no pathological changes, you call this a meniscal vascular signal. After that, or uh, with history of degeneration or trauma, you can call this a meniscal contusion or meniscal degeneration according to the clinical setting. Next is the popliteus hiatus, and we talked about this. The popliteus tendon passes right behind the uh, posterior horn of the lateral meniscus uh, within the meniscal capsular attachment, and this um, defect is called the popliteus hiatus, and this uh, of course, should never be mistaken for a peripheral meniscal tear. Uh, next in line is the transverse interminiscal ligament, and this is a transverse ligament coursing between the anterior horn of the an uh, medial and the lateral meniscus. So it's just a transverse horizontal fibrous band connecting both anterior horns, and it can be seen at the parasagittal cuts uh, within the central aspect of the joint can be mistaken for uh, meniscal tear. Of course, this is a prominent transverse intermeniscal ligament. The oblique intermeniscal ligament uh, is also uh, a common variant uh, that can be uh, very commonly seen and mistaken for a uh, meniscal tear or a loose intraarticular fragment. The meniscocapsular recess uh, is the space, uh, fluid filled space between the meniscus and the capsular attachment. And confined by the meniscocapsular ligaments highlighted here by the arrowheads, this is called a meniscocapsular recess. And uh, once you see the meniscocapsular ligament uh, passing through and clear cut, um, well defined linear base of the meniscus, you should not mistake this for a meniscocapsular separation or a peripheral meniscal tear. Another very commonly seen sign is the meniscal fluence sign. And this is a redundant free edge of the meniscal body, commonly seen, uh, and you can uh, just see the redundant appearance. And this is very normal. This is not a tear. Uh, and this is more commonly seen when the meniscus is at the borderline of being a discoid configuration. So uh, the bigger the base, of, uh, uh, the bigger the apex of the meniscus, it can be uh, of redundant appearance and give the meniscal flow on sign. One of the very common uh, pitfalls we always see, and this often refer, uh, being referred back to us from the orthopedist surgeon uh, with the suspicion of tumor, and this is just the hematopoietic bone marrow. So uh, the hematopoietic bone marrow, uh, there is red marrow reconversion, and on fat suppression sequences, you don't see the homogeneous hypointense signal of the marrow, of the fatty marrow. Instead, you see patchy hyperintense areas, and the corresponding T1 will see patchy hypointense areas, and these are uh, just a red marrow reconversion. And this is commonly seen in females in the menstruating age due to uh, underlying mild anemia. So now let's shift from the uh, common uh, pitfalls or the normal variants to the very, very important subs, uh, uh, very, very important topic of the meniscal tears. So there is a big debate uh, regarding the terminology and description of meniscal tears, but uh, recently in the orthopedic society, there has been uh, the Isacos classification, which uh, was first proposed in 2006 and revised at 2013. 
this is an arthroscopic uh, based uh, classification and it can easily be followed on MRI and it is very highly recommended uh, to use uh, at MRI reporting to unify the terminology between the radiologists and the orthopedist surgeons. So this marvelous di uh, diagram uh, represents all basic types of meniscal tears. So basically the meniscal tear can be a horizontal tear or a longitudinal tear. So a horizontal tear uh, would dissect the meniscus uh, and giving an upper and lower uh, flaps, uh, while a longitudinal tear will course from uh, the superior to the inferior surface along the axis of the meniscus. So the, the very basic types of meniscal tears are horizontal tear and a longitudinal tear. So longitudinal tears can be uh, uh, divided into uh, vertical longitudinal and vertical radial. So the difference uh, between the vertical longitudinal and a vertical radial tear is that the vertical longitudinal will course along parallel to the long axis of the meniscus from the upper surface to the lower surface, while the radial tear will course perpendicular to the long axis of the meniscus. So this is the long axis of the meniscus. A longitudinal tear, a longitudinal vertical tear will be parallel to this axis, while the long axis of the meniscus, a radial tear, will be perpendicular to that axis. So these are the basic types. We have other types of meniscal tears. These are the tears with displaced fragments. So uh, the two main types of meniscal tears with displaced fragments are vertical flap and horizontal flap. So a horizontal flap tear is a horizontal tear. It is close to uh, one of the surfaces, either superior or inferior surface of the meniscus, and results in an amputated uh, part, which is flipped uh, to the side. So you get a defect in the meniscal girth, and you see the meniscal fragment displaced, whether it's displaced at the center of the joint or uh, beneath the meniscal capsular attachment or beneath a collateral ligament. So basically, you get a uh, dimin uh, diminution of the meniscal girth and a displaced meniscal fragment. Uh, what about the vertical flap tear? I know the flap tears are um, uh, easily missed. Uh, they form a big problem to understand, uh, especially, especially for the junior staff, but I'll try to make it as easy as possible. So the vertical tear is a combination of these two. It is a radial tear, vertical radial tear, that continues for a small uh, distance as a vertical longitudinal. So actually, it's a radial tear. It goes initially perpendicular to the long axis and then continues parallel to the long axis. So it's a radial tear with a small longitudinal continuation. So the vertical flap tear is a mix of radial and it has both the radial and the longitudinal components while the horizontal flap tear is basically as similar to the original uh, horizontal uh, or cleavage tear and is just closer to the surface. It results in an amputated appearance of the meniscus and a displaced uh, meniscal flap, as we said. So when you describe a meniscal tear, it's not just enough to say there is a horizontal tear at the posterior or median meniscus and period. You can't just stop there you have to describe uh, very, very important um, uh, uh, variations within the meniscal tear. First, you have to comment on the tear depth. Is it a partial depth tear or a complete uh, thickness tear? So that's, of course, for the uh, vertical uh, tear, uh, like the one before. So is it just uh, interrupting one of the surfaces, the superior or the inferior surface, or is it coursing from superior to inferior surface. That's the tear depth, and this is applicable for the uh, vertical tears. The tear location, uh, and the tear location is described in zones. Zone 1 is the most peripheral at the meniscal base, zone 2 is the middle zone, and zone 3 is the apex. That's the free edge of the meniscus. Uh, you don't have to comment on the zones. You don't have to write which zone exactly uh, is involved in your report but you have to uh, be very clear 
when the meniscal tear is at the base of the meniscus because this is the zone one the base of the meniscus is the vascular area of the meniscus and this is uh, the area where the orthopedist surgeon can go and take sutures and uh, get a primary healing process in zone two and zone three there is no healing so when there is a tear at zone two or zone three that's the middle zone or the uh, free edge of the meniscus you have to do a meniscectomy okay so uh, the most important thing is to note when there is the injury at the zone one and the uh, base of the meniscus uh, you have to uh, specify this in your report because this tear uh, especially in the young age is a candidate for primary uh, repair uh, the radial location, of course, is very important. Uh, you specify the tear at the anterior horn, at the body, or at the posterior horn. Uh, the tear pattern, as we described, is it a horizontal tear? Is it a vertical flap? Is it a horizontal flap? Is it a complex tear, which is a mix of a horizontal and a vertical component? And uh, the next thing you have to comment on is the quality of tissues. So. You can have two uh, horizontal meniscal tears. Both are uh, described as linear hyperintense signal at the posterior horn medium meniscus reaching the inferior surface. But one is in the uh, setting of an acute trauma and the tear is linear and pencil sharp, and the other is in the setting of osteoarthritis and the surface of the meniscus is frayed and macerated. You, of course, have to uh, identify this in your report and you have to make it clear uh, if the tear edges are clear or the tear edges are frayed or macerated. Uh, the rest of the um, items are mainly for the arthroscopic uh, interest, not for our interest, but you have to make sure you are fulfilling uh, in your report, in the description of a meniscal tear, the tear depth, the tear location, and uh, the tear pattern, and the quality of tissues. These are the main items you have to fulfill. So let's uh, jump to illustrative diagrams to make things clear. I know uh, uh, just uh, describing with the diagrams is hard, so let's take a look at the uh, corresponding MRI images to make things clear. First of all, this is the meniscal degeneration, and this is just an intrasubstance hyperintense signal not reaching the meniscal surface. So they have the inferior surface is intact. The superior surface is intact this is the meniscal base this is the red zone this is the area where uh, you can do primary repair and this is the meniscal uh, free edge or the meniscal apex and we uh, said before this has to be a clear cut pencil sharp uh, apex of a triangle in the horns so this is a meniscal degeneration and of course as we said if you can see a similar signal in a 16 or 20 year old uh, patient, you don't call this meniscal degeneration unless there is uh, trauma. So the next thing is the uh, horizontal uh, meniscal tear or the oblique tear or sometimes called the horizontal cleavage tear. It's all the same. It is a tear that passes through the meniscal substance and bisects the meniscus into a, an upper flap and a lower flap. So a meniscal horizontal tear uh, at the sagittal scans, you will see this as a linear signal reaching one of the surface. This is reaching a superior surface. It can reach the inferior surface. And in the body, you will see this as a linear signal within the rectangular shape of the body. That's in the sagittal scans. In the coronal scans, you will see uh, in the horn, uh, which would be rectangular in that case, the meniscal tear, a horizontal signal, and in the body, which would be a triangular uh, in the coronal scans, you will also see this as a bisecting linear signal. So this is a horizontal tear. This is a horizontal cleavage tear because we call it a cleavage tear because the upper flap and the lower flap are of the same size. You can call it a meniscal uh, horizontal cleavage tear. You can call it a horizontal tear. If it's not reaching the apex and reaching one uh, of the surfaces clearly, you can call it an oblique tear. All of these are essentially horizontal tears. So this is a meniscal horizontal tear at the posterior horn of the median meniscus, extending from the base to the apex and basically bisecting the meniscus into two halves. 
This is another example. This is a horizontal meniscal tear reaching the inferior meniscal surface. You can call this a cleavage tear. You can call it an horizontal oblique tear. It's just extending a linear horizontal sing signal extending in the meniscal substance and interrupting uh, one of the surfaces. So this is a horizontal tear. What's the difference between a horizontal tear and a vertical tear? As we said, the vertical tear can be longitudinal or radial. So a vertical longitudinal tear will be coursing along the, as we said, the long axis of the meniscus. So cut number one is a sagittal scan passing through the meniscal body. And cut number two is the sagittal scan passing through the anterior and posterior uh, menisci, while cut number three is a coronal scan passing through the anterior horn, and cut number four is a coronal scan passing through the meniscal body. So if you take cut number one, this is uh, a very long uh, vertical tear extending from the anterior horn to the posterior horn, but there is no displacement. Uh, at this area, you will see a vertical longitudinal tear, that's a vertical signal extending from the superior meniscal surface to the inferior meniscal surface along the body. So this is cut number one. If you take the same cut at the horns, so here the meniscal uh, longitudinal axis is along this curvature and the tear is getting the same uh, long axis. So if you take a cut right here, sorry, if you take a cut right here, you will see a vertical defect at the anterior horn. And if the tear is in the posterior horn, you will see a vertical defect at the posterior horn. Uh, if you take a cut at the uh, anterior horn uh, in the coronal scans, you will see the vertical uh, cut also extending from superior to inferior surface and in the body, the same thing. So this is an example of a vertical longitudinal tear. So the tear is coursing along the long axis of the meniscus. This is a small horizontal component not uh, illustrated in the corresponding MRI image. So we're just demonstrating the vertical longitudinal tear near the meniscal base. So as you see, this is the tear from the superior surface to the inferior surface. And on the MRI, it's a linear signal from the superior surface to the inferior surface near the meniscal base and coursing along the longitudinal axis of the meniscus. This is another example of a vertical longitudinal tear. It courses from this, uh, along the long axis of the meniscus from superior to inferior surface. And this is the zoomed corresponding MRI image with a linear vertical signal, hyper intense near the meniscal base coursing from superior to inferior surfaces. Okay, so this is a vertical longitudinal tear. So what about the radial tear? The radial tear is essentially another vertical tear. So it courses from or transects from the superior surface to the inferior surface. But the difference between a longitudinal tear and a radial tear is the orientation. So a radial tear will be oriented perpendicular to the meniscal long axis. So to make it very clear, you cannot see a radial tear except when the meniscus is a rectangle. You don't see a radial tear in a triangle. So when you see a vertical signal extending from superior to inferior surface in a triangle, whether it's the body or the horn, according to sagittal or coronal cuts, when you see it, a vertical signal in a triangle, it's a vertical longitudinal tear. When you see the vertical signal in a rectangle, it's mostly a radial tear. And to make things clear, uh, this is a radial tear at the meniscal body. And you, when you take the sagittal cut, you will see this defect. But if you take the coronal cut at the same area, you will not see a linear signal extending from superior to inferior surface. In fact, you will see an amputation. You will see part of the meniscal body and the other part where the tear is coursing, especially when this tear is a wide one, you will see an amputated appearance. You will just, just see part of the body and the rest will be missing. And vice versa, of course, in the coronal scans. 
let's say there is a vertical tear at the anterior horn uh, of the median meniscus this is the radial uh, tear at the anterior horn when you take the coronal cut that's cut number three you will see this as this is the tear this is the direction of the cut both are perpendicular and you will see this as a vertical signal coursing from superior to inferior surface while if you take a sagittal scan at the same uh, site which will pass through the tear to the radial tear you will see an amputated appearance oh, that's called a ghost meniscus so this is another example that to make things clear this is a uh, radial vertical tear at the meniscal body and this is the corresponding MRI image which shows linear hyper intense vertical signal in a rectangle which is the body of the meniscus coursing from superior to inferior surfaces. A very important variant of the meniscal uh, radial tears is the meniscal root tear and this is, uh, as we clarified in the previous presentation, the meniscal root has always to pass the edge of the condyle. And when you don't see it, this is a meniscal root tear. And this is essentially a radial tear. So this is the coronal scan demonstrating a meniscal root tear. And this is a corresponding axial scan passing through the meniscus, which shows the root tear, which is actually a radial defect. It's, this is the long axis of the meniscus and their defect is perpendicular to the long axis. So it is essentially a radial tear. So what are complex tears? Complex tears are tears with horizontal and vertical component. You can have a horizontal and a vertical longitudinal, a horizontal and a vertical radial, branching, mixing, whatever. So when you see a horizontal component and a vertical or oblique component passing through both surfaces, you can call this a complex meniscal tear and of course don't forget to clarify that the edges of the tear are clear or macerated it, uh, are there any meniscal fragments is the meniscus amputated do you have any intraarticular loose bodies all these items are very important uh, to describe so of course uh, this is not all the type of tears we know we have a very important um, topic which is uh, tears with displaced fragments uh, we have three major tears with displaced fragments. That's a bucket handle tear, a vertical flap tear, and horizontal flap tear, as we uh, described before. So let's make them uh, clear as well. First, let's start with a bucket handle tear. So a bucket handle tear is a vertical longitudinal tear extending from anterior horn through the body and to the posterior horn. And this is the tear. And what happens next is... Uh, the inner uh, part of the torn meniscal substance gets flipped inside the joint like a handle of a bucket. So you can imagine this is like a handle of a bucket where you can lift the meniscus up from it. So it's just a vertical longitudinal tear extending along the whole length of the meniscus with displaced central fragment. This is, another this is another demonstration. So it's essentially a vertical longitudinal tear extending through the whole length of the meniscus and then gets displaced within uh, the central aspect of the joint. So how do we see uh, a bucket handle tear? Uh, the most important thing is we see an amputation of the meniscal girth. The body and both horns are diminished in girth. They are abnormal in shape and signal. And you will see a centrally displaced uh, meniscal fragment. This was also clear at the previous image. You can see the body of the median meniscus is very small compared to the body of the lateral meniscus. It is amputated and you can see here there is a meniscal fragment impacted within the central aspect of the joint space. Uh, the very very well-known sign of the double PCL sign and this happens of course only with the bucket handle tear of the median meniscus because a bucket handle tear of the lateral meniscus would not give the same sign. It would be something similar, but would be adjacent to the ACL or the PCL. So the centrally displaced menis meniscal fragment will be always impacted uh, when the tear is in the medium meniscus, anterior and uh, inferior to the posterior crochet ligament, giving the characteristic double PCL sign. 
So this was the first type. That was the bucket handle tear. And as we said, it is essentially a very big vertical longitudinal tear. So what about the vertical flap tear? We explained this before. So you have a vertical tear with a radial component passing perpendicular to the long axis of the meniscus and then continuing along the long axis with a longitudinal component. So you get the both types of vertical tears, the radial type, which continues with a longitudinal tear, both at the same uh, site. So this would give you a vertical flap tear. How can you identify a vertical flap tear? It's uh, called a moving tear. So uh, when you take, uh, for example, cut number one, you will see there is a vertical hyperintense signal near the meniscal apex, away from the base, okay, passing from the superior to the inferior surface. And you can see this in a triangle. So you can call this a vertical longitudinal tear. But as you scroll the images, you will see that the tear location is changing. It's moving. It was near the apex. Now it's at the mid zone. And when you go further, you can see it even closer to the base. So a moving uh, vertical tear is always suggestive of a vertical flap tear. And if you get the coronal images, you can, of course, see the cut where the radial component will be uh, identified as a vertical signal in a rectangle. Okay. So the radial component, as we said, is always in a rectangle and uh, longitudinal components or longitudinal tears would always be in a triangle. So a moving, a moving vertical tear would be suggestive of a vertical flap tear. And that's, of course, uh, if the tear is in situ. So this is not this is a vertical flap tear that is, which is not displaced. It's just uh, having the vertical flap configuration but it's not displaced. There are no displaced vertical fragments. So uh, uh, if, if the, uh, there is a vertical displaced uh, flap tear, you will see the meniscal fragment uh, displaced adjacent to the uh, PCL or the uh, ACL, mostly at the center of the joint. The last type of uh, displaced meniscal fragment uh, would be horizontal flap tear. And as we said, it is a horizontal tear but it's closer to one of the surfaces and the uh, torn uh, bisected fragment would be displaced mostly to the outer aspect of the joint and uh, this displaced fragment would uh, commonly be lodged between the meniscal capsular attachment or beneath uh, collateral ligament. So this is an example of a meniscal horizontal flap tear this is the body of the median meniscus and the body of the lateral meniscus. You can see that the median meniscal body is smaller. The, it's not exactly triangular. It's some sort of a globular shape. And there is a meniscal fragment here impacted between uh, the or, or underneath the inferior meniscocapsular attachment. So this is the inferior meniscocapsular ligament and the meniscal fragment is impacted right here. So this is very very critical to report because uh, this is one of the hidden lesions if you don't report this uh, the surgeon can go inside the knee with an arthroscope and search for it uh, he cannot identify it unless he changes uh, his uh, approach and entry uh, and actively uh, seeks uh, to identify the meniscal fragment but standard arthroscopic uh, approach he can very easily miss such a meniscal fragment which would always be forming an intraarticular loose body and might cause osteoarthritis or other problems. So what are the uh, hidden lesions uh, of the knee? Hidden lesions of the knee are lesions that you uh, have to clarify in the report because uh, arthroscopic assessment might miss. So these are lesions that the MRI plays a major role in their identification. The surgeon, if you don't clarify this in your report, if you miss this lesion in, on your MRI, the surgeon can go inside with an arthroscope and also miss the lesion and it would be a cause, of course, of a chronic problem. So uh, the most uh, important hidden lesions are the meniscal flap tears, as we said. These are the tears with displaced fragments. 
Another very important uh, entity is the meniscal ramp lesions. The meniscal ramp lesions are the lesions uh, occurring at the base of the meniscus. It commonly uh, implicates the meniscal capsular attachment or a, a vertical longitudinal tear at the extreme base of the meniscus just uh, adjacent to the meniscal capsular attachment and they call it uh, a ramp lesion as to the ramp of a uh, uh, parking lot where you uh, go into the parking lot uh, you descend with your car in a ramp and when you are going out you are just taking uh, the car out of the garage or the parking lot you take the ramp and go up uh, when you are going up the ramp you don't see <clears throat> you don't see the street in front of you so if you are taking a steep ramp actually you are going up the ramp and the street is blind and you don't see the street until you go to the top of the ramp and that is the exact nature of the meniscal ramp lesion uh, the arthroscope within the knee uh, would be like a car uh, going up a ramp of a parking lot so he has uh, the orthopedic surgeon has to go to the end of the ramp he has to go to the highest uh, convexity of this ramp to see any tear at the uh, base of this ramp so if you don't tell him there is an injury right there he might not go all this way and he might just see the ramp not seeing behind this uh, curvature where a meniscal tear can be hidden so this is the uh, essence of a ramp lesion it's essentially a peripheral longitudinal tear near the base of the meniscus or a meniscocapsular injury and both are called ramp lesions and we see ramp lesions very very commonly associated with ACL tears so when you uh, see an anterior cruciate ligament tear one of the things you have to search for is a ramp lesion uh, ACL tears can be uh, quite difficult uh, to assess on the MRI and especially partial or small tears may be missed uh, if not probed correctly within the arthroscope and you have to be very meticulous uh, when commenting on the ACL. Other uh, possibly hidden lesions are the chondral lesions which are lesions involving the articular cartilage uh, especially when uh, not in the weight bearing areas. So uh, there might be a chondral lesion at the anterior margin of a femoral condyle at a lateral margin of the femoral condyle not in the standard weight bearing uh, area and you have to highlight these chondral lesions because they may they might be the only cause of pain uh, for the patient and an arthroscope may go in and out and uh, yield a negative result if not searching for this chondral lesion the other uh, two uh, entities are the posterolateral corner and posteromedial corner uh, injuries and as we said before of course these are uh, injuries to small ligaments uh, within the peripheral extreme periphery of the joint and they can cause instability they may be a cause of pain and they are easily missed by arthroscopy and the repair is a very demanding job so uh, posterolateral corner or posteromedial corner injuries have to be also uh, clearly highlighted within the report uh, to make sure that the orthopedist knows what he is going into. So peripheral longitudinal tears, as we said, the ramp lesion. So imagine the arthroscope is down here and going up the meniscus, and this is the ramp. Okay, so just like a car going up a ramp to get, exit a parking lot, the arthroscope goes up, 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 up. And if he doesn't reach this point, he will not be able to see the tear at the apex of this ramp, at the height of this ramp. So there can be a ramp tear like this, a peripheral longitudinal tear at the base of the meniscus. And if the surgeon doesn't go with the arthroscope up to this point, up to the arrow point, he might miss the tear. Another ramp lesion, as we said, is the meniscocapsular injury. So a tear at the meniscocapsular attachment would be hyper intense and similar to the peripheral longitudinal tear and you will be seeing ill definition of the meniscofemoral uh, of the meniscocapsular uh, attachment this is another uh, example of a meniscocapsular injury where you can see the hyperintensity and the irregularity at the meniscocapsular attachment and this is called a ramp 
lesion because the arthroscope will be going here and he has to continue down to this point to see the tear. We described uh, horizontal and vertical flap tears before. We're not going through this again. Uh, what I want to highlight, as we said in the first lecture, is the ACL tears. The axial images are of extreme importance. In this sagittal uh, scan, that's a protein density without fat suppression. You can see the ACL is in normal uh, course. It has a rather homogeneous hypointense signal, although you can't quite clearly identify the femoral attachment. But when you see the axial image, there is clearly a complete tear of the ACL femoral attachment. And this hypointensity is not there that you normally expect. Instead, there is fluid signal, ill definition, and uh, surrounding edema. Another pitfall is the ACL mucoid degeneration. That's one of the aging processes that happens within the ACL. And you can see this as a homogeneous hyperintense intermediate signal involving all the ACL fibers, which appear as a cloud or a fan shaped, but the uh, contours are always preserved. So you will always be observing the contours of the ACL, but it appears to be expanded and intermediate in signal. So uh, please don't mistake ACL mucoid degeneration for partial tears or uh, complete tears, and we have th seen this happen a lot. Uh, ACL mucoid degeneration is an aging process. It happens normally. It's Most of the time it's asymptomatic, and you cannot mistake this for ACL injury. And uh, when you suspect ACL mucoid degeneration, you have to look at the sagittal T1. And this is the pathognomonic appearance of an ACL mucoid degeneration and that's the clouded expanded appearance of the ACL fibers, giving this ill-defined intermediate gray signal, and this is pathognomonic for an ACL mucoid degeneration. It should not be ever mistaken for an ACL tear. Uh, what, the last thing I want to talk about is the chondral injuries, and chondral injuries uh, are easily missed. There are four grades of chondral injuries, chondropathy or chondromalacia, whatever you want to call it. So in grade one, you have just chondral softening. That's a slight hyperintensity within the surface of the uh, articular cartilage. In grade two, you will have less than 50% uh, defect, whether an ulcer, fibrillation, or a fissure. Less than 50% of the cartilage girth would be defective. In grade three, you will have more than 50% uh, of the cartilage girth defective. Also, whether it's an ulcer, fibrillation, fissure, or a chondral flap, but the subchondral bone would not be exposed. In grade 4, you will have a full thickness chondral uh, wear or uh, defect with exposed subchondral bone. And when the subchondral bone is exposed, you will commonly see subchondral marrow edema. You will see subchondral cystic changes, and that, of course, would propagate to uh, osteoarthritis. So uh, these are various types of uh, grade 3 chondral injuries. That's a uh, chondral fissure. Uh, that's a chondral flap tear. You can see there's a fissure and the uh, articular cartilage is elevated. That's a pure chondral ulcer. Okay, And this one, uh, that one, and this one, you can all see that uh, the subchondral bone uh, is not exposed. The subchondral bone shows normal signal, there is no edema and no um, cystic changes. Uh, in counterpart to this, there is fibrillation and serration of the articular cartilage of the retropatellar hyaline cartilage with exposed subchondral bone showing patchy marrow edema. So that, that's grade 3 or uh, that's grade 4 chondral uh, injury and all these are grade 3 defects. So, last two things are posterolateral corner uh, structures and posteromedial corner uh, structure injuries. So, the posterolateral corner uh, is composed of several uh, structures passing uh, be uh, beside each other. That's the lateral collateral ligament, the popliteus tendon, the popliteofibular tendon, that's uh, a ligament, I mean, that's a small ligament passing from the fibular head and surrounding the popliteus tendon, and there is the arcuate uh, ligament. So in the sagittal scans, you can see uh, this is the expected site where the popliteus tendon will pass. This 
small ligament between the fibular head and the uh, posterolateral aspects of the tibia plateau is the arcuate ligament and the one posterior to it connecting the fibular head to the popliteal standard is the popliteofibular ligament. So this is the normal uh, appearance. This is the arcuate ligament connecting the fibular head to the tibial plateau. This is the popliteofibular ligament connecting the fibular head to the popliteus tendon as it passes through the hiatus and these are the normal structures. And of course, when you get a posterolateral corner injury, uh, that can be with or without uh, uh, bone contusions or fractures. You can get a tear at the arcuate ligament, lateral collateral ligament, as in this case, the popliteofibular ligament, and you will see distorted anatomy, localized edema, and uh, hematoma formation. So that's another example that's complete disruption of the lateral collateral ligament. You don't see the arcuate ligament, you don't see the popliteofibular ligament, everything uh, is disrupted at the posterolateral corner. Uh, the posteromedial uh, corner, there is an important uh, ligament uh, that's called the posterior oblique ligament. That's quite recent to be described, I think it's in the last five or six years, that we began to comment on the posterior oblique ligament injuries, and that's posteromedial corner injuries. Uh, because they found that uh, when uh, posteromedial corner structures are injured, this can cause uh, instability uh, of the knee, and that, of course, mostly happens in association with ACL. So you do the ACL repair, they do an ACL graft, and then the patient persistingly complains. The complaint persists. The ACL graft is intact, there is nothing wrong with it, but the patient is always feeling some sort of instability and some sort of discomfort, and that might be attributed to a ramp lesion that was missed or a posteromedial corner injury. So the most important structure at the posteromedial corner is the POL. It is the posterior oblique ligament, and that is a linear ligament that passes posterior and slightly superior to the medial collateral ligament. So this is the MCL. This is the view from the medial side. This is the medial collateral ligament. And posterior and slightly superior to it is the fibers of the posterior oblique ligament. And you will always be able to see this clearly, especially when there is slight effusion. So these are the fibers of the medial collateral ligament. And these very nice linear uh, hypointense fibers are the fibers of the posterior oblique ligament. And you will always see the, the posterior oblique ligament at the level uh, of the semi-membranosis uh, uh, attachment or slightly higher to this at the site where you will see a Baker cyst. This is the same site that you will see uh, or uh, identify the posterior oblique ligament. So that's uh, posterior lateral corner and posterior medial corner injuries. And uh, that's more or less all of the hidden and uh, commonly missed lesions on MRI of the knee. Uh, when a posterior medial corner uh, uh, posterior oblique ligament is torn, you will not be seeing it. This is the MCL, and this is a torn posterior oblique ligament. Co counterpart of compare this nice intact POL to this torn ill-defined one. You will always see localized edema and fluid and ill-definition of the ligament fibers at a level just superior to the uh, knee joint space. Uh, that's another example, an intact medial collateral ligament and a torn posteromedial uh, corner uh, structure, torn posterior oblique ligament. At, and that, of course, happens at the site, as we said, of the uh, just superior to the semimembranosis insertion and where the Baker cyst originates. So, guys, this is just the beginning. Uh, that video, I hope, uh, clarified some of your uh, questions and the areas where we commonly see mistakes in the reports. Uh, I hope that the you don't ever mistake one of the normal variants for a lesion. You don't ever fall in the, in the common pitfalls. You don't miss uh, a ramp lesion. You don't miss a posterior oblique ligament or posterior, uh, posterior medial corner structure injury. And uh, good luck to you all in the next video. We will begin demonstrating uh, several cases uh, and uh, demonstrating the technique of uh, writing the report for each of these cases 
and uh, stay tuned guys don't forget to subscribe to the channel and good luck and see you all in the next video thank you